webinar. Um, now, before we begin, and we do have a lot more people still joining, we're going to jump to a really quick uh, opening poll question for folks where uh, I want to get a sense of everyone's knowledge of the current topic. So if you could take about maybe 20 or 30 seconds and please uh, let us know how do you rate your current knowledge on this topic. Uh, you have selections of none, minimal, moderate, extensive. So go ahead and just take a couple of seconds to click on the option here for you to rate your current knowledge on this topic of gangs and human trafficking. Again, you could just simply take your mouse and click on the button there next to the, uh, the circle there next to your option. I'm going to give folks maybe about 10 more seconds to do this. the folks for finding great feedback. All right. All right, so it looks like everyone's at around moderate to minimal, it looks like. So that's good to know. Uh, so everyone here looks to gain some uh, good knowledge in regards to our content being presented. Great. Thank you all very much for providing um, that information and doing that poll. Uh, so that being said, I'm going to go ahead and open this up to uh, today's webinar. Again, welcome to everyone, and thank you all for joining. Uh, today's webinar, Gangs and Human Trafficking. My name is William Moore, and I am with OJJDP's National Training and Technical Assistance Center. And again, welcome to today's webinar. Before we start, I would like to take just a couple of minutes to discuss a few features of the Adobe Connect webinar platform to provide uh, a few announcements as well to keep in mind. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be published on Intact's YouTube page. On Intact's YouTube page, you will be able to view archived webinars. Please take a moment to view the webinars that we have, especially those in and around uh, juvenile justice and child uh, victimization related topics, et cetera. Any supporting materials or transcripts that you need for any webinars that you see, you can feel free to reach out to the OJJDP TTA help desk. Now, for those wishing to download a copy of important documents and resources related to today's webinar, including the handouts and, uh, excuse me, the PowerPoint and the bios for today's uh, presenters, you may do so by selecting the documents in the handouts pod that's directly above the chat pod. Again, here you'll find the PowerPoint, you'll find an FAQ to help address with any technical related questions. All you have to do is simply click on the name of the file and then click the download button. At the end of today's webinar, there will be a time where you all will be able to submit your questions if you hadn't already. Um, these questions will be answered during our Q&A session towards the end of the webinar. In the meantime, if you do have a question, please type your question in the chat box as they arise. Now, we do understand with the current uh, environment that most of you should be uh, or are uh, practicing social distancing and are more than likely viewing alone. However, in a chance that you're, say, with another individual um, or additional people with you in the room today, we do want to get an accurate portrayal of how many people have joined us. So if you did join with maybe additional people, please type in the total number of additional people that are in the room with you today if you do have additional people that are joining with you in the webinar room. Again, just uh, type in the total number of additional people. If you're viewing by yourself, there's no need to type anything at this time only additional people that may be in the room with you today. Please note that attendees will receive an automated uh, thank you email with uh, the end of, at the end of this webinar, and it will include a certificate of attendance. Now, again, for those who indicate that they're with a group of individuals, uh, please note that you can download the group validation form in the handouts pod. You can complete that and send it to OJJDPTTA at usdoj.gov if you wish to receive a certificate for the others that are in the group with you. 
if you are logged in, you will receive the certificate. However, if you're looking to receive the certificate for others that are in the group with you that are not signed on into the virtual room, just fill out that form and we can get those certificates to you all, uh, indicating your attendance for today's webinar. So with that being said, I'll go ahead and turn over today's webinar to our moderator, Ms. Cynthia Pappas with the USDOJ uh, Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Take it away. Great. Thank you, William. Uh, again, my name is Cindy Pappas. I am a senior policy advisor with the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention within the Special Victims and Violent Offenders Division. And on behalf of OJJDP, under the leadership of Administrator Karen Harp, I would like to welcome you all and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule during these unprecedented times to join us today for our discussion on the intersection of gangs and human trafficking. OJJDP is a component of the Office of Justice programs within the office, within the U.S. Department of Justice. Our mission is to support state, local communities, and tribal jurisdictions in your efforts to develop and implement effective programs for juveniles, to strengthen the juvenile justice system's efforts to protect public safety, hold offenders accountable, and provide services that address the needs of youth and their families. With funding support from OGJDP, the National Gang Center, managed by the Institute for Intergovernmental Research, has served as the prominent resource for the field by providing national leadership, coordination, and resources to prevent and respond to gang violence. Please see the information on, on the webinar now. The link is here to the National Gang Center website for more information and resources to help in your efforts to address chronic and emerging gang problems and to create comprehensive solutions to prevent gang violence, reduce gang involvement, and suppress gang-related crime in your community. I would like to thank the dedicated staff at the National Gang Center, especially Director Mina Harris, for her dedication and focus and professionalism in preparing today's webinar. So today, our focus is on the nature of gang involvement in human trafficking, the challenges in investigation and prosecution, along with some potential solutions and resources available to support law enforcement and prosecution efforts throughout the process. We have a lot to cover, and it is my great pleasure to introduce today's panel of subject matter experts. Their full bios are located in the handout section, so I won't read all of their, their fabulous information to you. Just a brief overview, and then I will turn it over. You'll hear from retired Chief of Police Sean Baldwin, who is a research associate with the Institute for Intergovernmental Research's Youth and Community Justice Programs Group, and supports the National Gang Center with law enforcement anti-gang training and technical assistance. Mr. Baldwin served 25 years as a law enforcement officer in Fort Pierce, Florida, serving his last nine years as chief of police. Mr. Baldwin holds a master's degree in criminal justice administration from Lynn University. Next, you will hear from Detective Guy Baker, who has been with the Missoula, Montana Police Department since 1990, where he served as the lead investigator in more than 1,000 state and federal criminal cases, including numerous sex trafficking, and child sex, sexual exploitation cases. Detective Baker is certified as an instructor in both street gangs and sex trafficking through the Montana Law Enforcement Academy. In addition, Detective Baker served as, a, as the Senior Vice President of the Northwest Gang Investigators Association. During his career, he has been the recipient of many prestigious awards, including a Victim Service Award from the United States Attorney's Office and a Director's Award from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And last but certainly not least, you will hear from Detective Frank Nathana, who is the commanding officer of the Identification Section, Kidnap Investigations Team, and Human Trafficking Investigation Unit, as well as Executive Officer of the Hostage Negotiation Team at the Suffolk County, New York Police Department, where he has served for over 17 years. Detective Lieutenant Nathana commands the teams responsible for kidnapping and human trafficking investigations and was integral in the creation of the Human Trafficking Investigations Unit, which is dedicated to investigating sex trafficking in its jurisdiction. Detective Lieutenant Masana holds a master's degree in chemistry and, and bachelor's degrees in criminal justice and chemistry. 
So with that, I will turn it over to, to Sean to get us started. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you so much, Cynthia. And it's uh, great to see so many people online from all over the place. It's great to see so much interest in, uh, in this topic, which is uh, critical and important to us. If you're uh, not familiar with the National Gang Center, Cynthia gave you a little bit of information, but we'll provide some contact information at the end of the presentation for you. And I want to get started here with just a uh, definition or an understanding of what human trafficking is. So the definition of sex, sex trafficking, label tra trafficking from federal law is on the screen. Um, of course, state and local laws may vary somewhat, so I encourage you to study the laws in your local jurisdiction. Um, but what I, what I want to point out here that's extremely important is that both sex trafficking and labor trafficking, um, according to federal law, prove, proves that um, the victim is participating by force, fraud, or coercion. Except in cases of sex tra tra trafficking involving children under the age of 18. In these cases, it's not necessary to prove force. It's important for us to remember that children are victims in these cases. Um, so I want to reinforce that. And uh, with that, we're going to move on to a couple of uh, poll questions. Will, have you got that ready for us? So you'll see on your screen, a, uh, we've got two questions here for you. The first is, um, with respect to human or sex trafficking, has your jurisdiction experienced any of the following? Pay attention to the last uh, answer there. It's not applicable. If uh, someone is online here, we understand we've got a very diverse uh, audience from different backgrounds. If you do not know or, um, or um, probably check them not applicable, Ace there for us. Good to see the responses coming in. We'll give a uh, couple more seconds here to get everybody online. So we do see quite a quite a uh, large percentage of the percent of the participants are experiencing issues with human trafficking and looks like about half um, showing uh, trafficking that's facilitated by gang members or uh, acting independently. So Will, when you're comfortable that uh, we've got our answers in here, we can move on to the next question. The next question is if your jurisdiction has experienced gang-related or human trafficking cases, has the number of cases increased or decreased over the last five years? So we'll give a couple more seconds there for everybody to finish up. And that is a uh, pretty uh, firm majority there for the uh, increase in sex trafficking over the last five years. Thank you for your input on that. And well, when you're, yeah, okay, we can close that. So just a reminder, as we uh, proceed here, if you've got questions, please top, type, uh, type those into the, uh, the question box, and we'll see if we can get to those at the end of the, end of the presentation. I'm going to spend the next few minutes sharing some research and information about gang involvement in human trafficking. And the first step piece of information here I want to provide is from the Polaris Project, which is an organization that operates the U.S. National Human Trafficking Hotline. Uh, using their call data, 
They provided us with a map showing locations where they believe human trafficking exists. Now, this is not necessarily gang-involved activity, but human trafficking of all types. Of course, the map is only based on calls, and they don't get a call about every case. Um, but clearly, I think this demonstrates that uh, there's a potential for human trafficking to happen everywhere across the United, United States. So the Polaris Project also has used this data to, uh, to break down the types of trafficking cases that they handle through their call center. I've seen this described as business models that are being used by traffickers. I prefer the term criminal models that are being used by traffickers because that's exactly what it is. But just to talk about this for just a second, so on the left, um, the Polish Project sees trafficking most commonly being carried out as escort services or residential-based operations or pornography operations. And you can see all the way on the right where sex and labor trafficking are combined, they see trafficking carried out as illicit massage, health and beauty operations, bars, strip clubs, and then other illicit activities. And of course, labor trafficking is in the center there with uh, domestic, domestic work, agriculture, and um, the traveling sales, sales crews. So there are, uh, we've identified about 25 different business models. Uh, those are the, the most popular. Um, and that might give you some uh, indications of where to look in your community as to where that's happening. So now let's move on to some of the research that addresses gang involvement uh, more directly. So researchers from the University of Portland conducted a study that analyzed trends among victims of commercial sexual exploitation of children. This study found 469 unduplicated cases with an average referral age of 15.5 years old, and the youngest victim was just eight years old. Most victims were female, but just as importantly there, not all victims were female. So that's important to remember. And over 62% of the cases, the victims were dealing with uh, addiction, which is an important factor in uh, human trafficking. And then finally, uh, and more directly to the purpose of this webinar, is about half of the cases had a gang connection to them. So that is a, a, certainly a large number and a significant uh, finding from that study. Um, I wanted to uh, just, when this study came out, it was actually done under the direction of the U.S. Attorney for the District of Oregon. And when that study was published, she um, published a quote, and I'm going to read this for the benefit of anybody that might be just listen, listening by audio and not online here visually with us. But she said, gangs have learned that it's cheaper and less risky to traffic girls in guns or drugs. Maybe you just a second to think about that statement. It's absolutely awful, but unfortunately it's true in uh, communities across the United States. So in 2016, researchers in San Diego conducted a study that was aimed at determining the nature and extent of gang involvement and sex trafficking in San Diego County, and that's California. This research shows just how profitable sex trafficking can be. In San Diego alone, it's an $810 million per year industry. Um, gang members are highly involved, um, as indicated in this study. 85% of the facilitators were gang affiliated, and they identified over 110 gangs that were involved in the uh, tra trafficking activity. The average age of entry in the trafficking was 14.5, 15.5 for the victims. And the study also brings up an extremely important point about recruitment. It's found that gangs are directly recruiting from middle and middle and high schools. Uh, they're using these as recruiting grounds. So there's also research from the National Gang Survey. And uh, this last study was done in 2015. I just want to add a note. There's some work being done to refresh this uh, survey now. So we have got more current data 
on its way. So this survey tells us that 15 percent of the of the law enforcement agencies that responded um, indicated that gang involvement uh, in human trafficking. Um, and this may be uh, un underreported actually uh, just due to the uh, data sets that law enforcement has. Um, they all indicated an, an increase in gang uh, related sex traffic in, in the previous two years. And gangs involved in sex traffic are working with other gangs, even rival gangs, to relocate and exchange victims. And we've actually seen that in real life in several several cases that is going on. So even gangs that uh, go to war each other are cooperating, um, and it's because of the amount of money that's at stake here. So I wanted to point out that some states have done their own gang threat assessments, um, and they're starting to include information now on gang involvement and sex trafficking. This particular example is from Texas and was published in 2018. The Texas report made several useful findings. First of all, gangs across Texas are engaged in sex trafficking of both adults and juveniles. Gangs are attracted to sex trafficking by perceived low risk and high profitability. And the gang involvement may be either organized, where several or the entire gang membership is involved, or it may be just gang members that are operating independently. Importantly, it also includes evidence that the human trafficking by gangs is conducted by national, regional, and even small neighborhood gangs. So of course, all of us um, watch the news, and there is growing um, amounts of news coverage concerning this whole issue with uh, gang involvement in in human trafficking, and it's from across, it's absolutely from across the nation. So in summary, gang involvement in human trafficking is motivated by this perception of low risk and high profitability, and again, that's a perception by the gang members. It occurs universally in communities of all sizes. And it includes national, regional, and neighborhood gangs. And that's, that shows us that it's not just the national gangs that people are reading about in the news and the media, that neighborhood street gangs are dangerous too, for sure. And then finally, uh, gang involvement may be highly organized or limited to individual gang members acting, acting on their own. So with that research, I'm going to turn the uh, presentation over to Detective Guy Baker from the Missoula Police Department. Uh, Guy, take it from here. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, be included in this important webinar. Um, I like to say that uh, sex trafficking is the new drug of street gangs. And, uh, you know, it's been reported that Human trafficking worldwide is the second leading criminal enterprise, only behind drugs and ahead of weapons. And the United States uh, is is no different and very much a consumer of commercial sex and people that exploit women and uh, minors in sex trafficking and pornography uh, are very much involved with gangs too. This gang increased uh, or increase in gang controlled sex trafficking uh, as Sean had just reported, it actually goes back about a decade. The National Gang Intelligence Center uh, had reported in 2011 and then again in 2013 that, that street gangs and outlaw motorcycle gangs have expanded their criminal scope to include human trafficking. So they've realized that, as been said, that the high yield, low risk uh, that benefits those who uh, exploit people into sex trafficking is very easy to uh, run that criminal enterprise. They're focusing more uh, on it being a business activity because the police historically are focused on drug trafficking 
and uh, not so much on human trafficking. And uh, they know this. They know that uh, they're not getting their doors kicked in when they're running girls as opposed to when they're running drugs. The unique aspect of sex trafficking over drug trafficking is that a human is a reusable commodity. You know, if you have if you have an ounce of meth and you're selling that for four hundred dollars, you have your four Benjamins, but your product is gone after the sale. Or if you have a human, you can sell her again and again, over and over. And selling a girl at two hundred dollars a trick, only three times a day, is four thousand a week, over fifteen thousand a month, and that's just one female. And unfortunately. Uh, these girls, these victims, uh, are with a lot more than three tricks a day. And uh, the span of control that an exploiter or a pimp uh, or gang member is usually more than one girl. The high profitability, low risk has been mentioned. Uh, it's very definitely uh, a factor in why gangs have become involved more and more in sex trafficking. Uh, historically, law enforcement is not really aware of what's going on. And uh, as they become more aware and start to focus on, on these cases, uh, they're seeing that the activity in their individual communities is greater than they initially thought. Uh, comparing sex trafficking to drug trafficking, uh, much less involvement. You're not paying ahead. You're not being fronted drugs. You're not having an initial investment other than uh, maybe paying for some uh, advertisements on websites, and you have a criminal enterprise that you can run from your smartphone or a tablet uh, in a parking lot of a uh, Starbucks or at a mall or at a hotel, and you can post these ads and travel from city to city. As I said a minute ago, law enforcement's efforts are less focused simply because uh, oftentimes they're not aware of what's going on in their community. And so until law enforcement gets better training, they're having contact with these interstate criminals uh, that are traveling from city to city on the interstate freeway system, but uh, they're just failing to recognize what they see. They're not recognizing it as they see it uh, on those traffic stops. Uh, with girls, obviously, the commodity is easily replaced. So if the girl is arrested or she runs away, gets away, you lose that commodity. Uh, it's very easy to find another victim. Gang members uh, actively recruit females uh, by catering to their needs. So uh, a particular at-risk group uh, in the United States are runaways. And it's reported that somewhere between 100 and 200,000 American kids hit the streets each year, and they are at particular risk because when kids hit the streets, uh, they have not planned. They find out very quickly that they cannot provide their basic, basic necessities of food, clothing, and shelter, and that puts them at uh, risk for exploitation. Uh, girls are commonly lured uh, by false promises, uh, status, uh, protection, money, and loyalty, and possession things, possessory things that uh, the gang can provide to them. So from the outside looking in, oftentimes it, it, it's pretty alluring for a female, uh, but once she uh, makes some of those decisions, uh, she finds herself very quickly in a situation that she can't get out of. Um, females are commonly sexually exploited uh, when they get involved with gangs and uh, this commercial sex uh, that they are compelled to engage in is just revenue for the gang. It's important to remember that the difference between a prostitute and a sex trafficking victim is choice. You know, a prostitute is someone who's engaging in commercial sex on their own volition, uh, their own choice, and they're benefiting from it, where a sex trafficking victim is someone who's being compelled by another person through force, fraud, or coercion to engage in commercial sex, and that other person is the one benefiting from it. Females traditionally are viewed as having little, little value other than how they can be exploited uh, in gang life, and uh, this is absolutely true when it comes to uh, sexual exploitation and commercial sex. Uh, getting out of the situation once they get in is very difficult, especially if you're 
dealing with neighborhood gangs in urban areas where the female uh, is relegated to live in that area where the gang operates and the threats and intimidation uh, to keep that victim compliant and to keep them from uh, getting out of the situations is is prevalent. Um, common things I'm uh, okay, gangs prey on vulnerable females. Uh, withdrawing from family and uh, long time uh, associations of friends or school activities such as sports uh, or other school type activities is a common thing that you're going to see. Uh, they're also at times spending spending time and starting to associate with others than they had traditionally done in the past, obviously, uh, as this is uh, readily apparent in middle school and high school where they start to associate with gang members and uh, not the people that they had associated in the past. Oftentimes, females are courted into a uh, situation involving commercial sex by someone who they believe to be their boyfriend. Uh, and this boyfriend, uh, oftentimes being a gang member, has one sole intent, and that is to get the female into the gang where she is going to be exploited. And it's, it's important to know that lots of times these females uh, will not refer to uh, the person exploiting them as their pimp, uh, but they almost always refer to them as their boyfriend. So uh, making your case uh, with the elements of either a state or federal prosecution, uh, it's not it's not that important to get them to admit that it's a pimp. It can just be the boyfriend who fits the elements, and that's, that's the common reference. Females uh, known to wear clothes uh, or symbols or other uh, attire that's affiliated with the gang, um, that would be something that you would want to look for in, in the females that you're dealing with. Substance abuse uh, is very common, especially with heroin. Methamphetamine is uh, common too, but uh, once you get a victim and they become dependent on the person who's exploiting them, uh, it becomes a tether and they become reliant. And then the use of heroin is going to have someone that uh, maybe is a little unwilling to participate uh, through suggestion. It kind of takes the edge off there and it makes them more compliant. It also then makes them dependent uh, if they choose not to do what they're asked to do uh, where, you know, you could be heavy-handed with them, or you could just deny them heroin, uh, very get dope sick, and, and then be likely more compliant. Body branding uh, or tattooing is uh, very common uh, to associate females. Um, when coming in contact with uh, females that have uh, tattoos or body brands, um, and they have a reluctance to discuss them, but they're common, uh, you're probably onto a, a trafficking situation. Oftentimes, if you have a female that has a uh, similar tattoo, let's say you have a dollar sign by their left ear, and then you have a younger female that has a new dollar sign tattoo near her left ear uh, and a reluctance for them to talk, you're probably dealing with uh, a bottom or a girl who's been in the game for a, a bit and she has a newer, uh, a newer victim with her. So looking for those, uh, gang-related tattoos um, is important, too. Um, running away from home and skipping school, as I said a minute ago, runaways are at particular risk for exploitation once they hit the streets uh, and they cannot provide their basic, uh, basic means. They're at risk for exploitation. And those that exploit girls and gangs uh, are very much aware and keen to look for any opportunity they can uh, to come across females uh, in those situations on the street. Unexplained injuries are gonna be common with these victims. Uh, the traditional injuries that you'd see, like bruising on the triceps of the arms, which are indicative of someone who's being grabbed or shook, uh, bruising on the breasts of the genital area, uh, which are targeted areas of assault, uh, not to mention what you'd expect in broken bones or black eyes, uh, cigarette burns, cigarette burns in the hairline uh, are some good uh, injuries or 
are often specific to trafficking victims. Identifying gangs involved in, in human trafficking, looking in the right places, um, social media, online uh, is very, very common. Uh, being aware of uh, the social platforms uh, of the kids in your community are important. The motels uh, and hotels in your community, uh, sex trafficking by gangs can take place at low-end uh, motels. It can take place at high-end hotels. So being aware of the activity in uh, your local districts or areas that have multiple hotels uh, is a good thing. Uh, illicit massage parlors are, are very commonly uh, places that are exploitive uh, in the commercial sex industry. Um, sometimes people say, what makes an illicit massage parlor? Uh, this one that's advertising all hours of the night, uh, the girls are staying on uh, the premise. Um, they're not to and from work eight to five like a traditional a uh, massage therapist, and uh, usually commercial sex uh, is, is prevalent in illicit massage parlors. On the streets uh, where you have tracks, uh, you're going to see commercial sex, uh, but it's, it's almost across the board that the tracks in cities across the Americas are seeing less activity uh, due to the ease and uh, anonymity that uh, the Internet provides in posting ads and uh, conducting commercial sex online. Schools um, and parks and social places where young females are, uh, they're going to be uh, where people are going to be looking to recruit them. And then if you have gangs that have both males and females looking for uh, gangs that have greater numbers of females, uh, that seems to be somewhat relegated to certain areas of the country. Uh, lots of places uh, don't have uh, male and female gangs. Uh, but again, females hanging out with the, with the gangs, even if they are playing or think they are members or if they are just, uh, just around, they are more likely being exploited. Overcoming some of these investigative challenges, uh, training for law enforcement uh, is important. So training for gang investigations as well as human trafficking and then uh, looking for the organization. So looking for uh, drug conspiracies and organized crime patterns that involve human trafficking and sex trafficking uh, sometimes is the door that opens uh, to get into an organization or a gang. And usually comparing uh, even state and federal statutes uh, for sex trafficking, especially of minors, uh, against your state statutes, you're probably going to see that uh, there's bigger sentences uh, in trafficking of humans than there are in running drugs. Oftentimes those drug conspiracies involve uh, gangsters and they also involve trafficking of people. The investigative efforts uh, by law enforcement should be uh, undertaken to understand what's going on in your community. It's very common, especially in smaller to mid-sized cities, that there's this misperception that, that the community as well as law enforcement seems to believe that sex trafficking doesn't occur in our community. It only occurs in other countries or in big cities and other states, when in fact uh, most cities uh, of any size that have a, uh, if they have an economy for commercial sex and they are in an interstate freeway system, more than likely they are seeing sex trafficking and exploitation uh, by gang members. Looking in the right places, as we talked a minute ago, massage parlors, uh, truck stops are another one for smaller communities. Uh, prostitution is common in truck stops of any size. Strip clubs, uh, the hotels we talked about, uh, and then the track. So when you find minors, uh, runaways, missing or reported missing juveniles, and they're around illicit massage parlors, truck stops, strip clubs, or hotels, uh, you should take a real look at them as being a victim and not just someone who uh, is a runaway where we want to get early on treating them uh, as a victim and establish that rapport. So the gang's involvement uh, can be organized. It can be individual. Uh, it's very common that it's individual, that a gang, gang member or, or two might hit the road and uh, they start posting ads at communities uh, in surrounding areas or around uh, 
you know, on a circuit uh, through the interstate freeway system. Um, for law enforcement, oftentimes these cases are going to start at the individual level, a traffic stop by a patrol officer or a, a complaint of a domestic disturbance or a noise complaint or even a report of prostitution uh, at a location or a motel. And uh, that's why it's so important having patrol officers trained and knowing what they what they see so they can recognize the indicators. And, and oftentimes, looking more than that initial complaint, you're going to start to find that you're coming across incidents of sex trafficking involving gang members. Uh, understanding your conspiracy laws and uh, the gang enhancement aspects of your state and federal laws uh, can be very advantageous in working these cases as you start to work a conspiracy that can draw uh, other people that aren't even there. Oftentimes you run across females, maybe a bottom and a younger female who have been directed to hit a interstate circuit within a state where the person who's exploiting them, the gang member or the pimp, uh, doesn't even travel with them and they remain back in their state. Uh, where I work, that's fairly common that you have uh, pimps and gang members from larger cities in other states that uh, send girls uh, into the Northwest, and uh, then you're starting to look at uh, cell phones and uh, money transactions where they're sending money back to a certain uh, person. So looking for all those uh, evidentiary items, all devices, cell phones, uh, tablets, anything electronic, even if it appears broken, uh, you want to take those because it could get into a multi-state uh, criminal organization. Partnering with a gang intelligence analyst early uh, is, is very important. And sometimes if law enforcement is working in a uh, smaller agency where they may not have that, you usually can rely on your state partners uh, and federal partners uh, for that uh, intelligence information. And then looking to follow the money. Money, just like with in drug investigations, is what uh, drives this crime. So uh, more and more states are starting to uh, enact laws that are property subject to criminal forfeiture. Uh, federal statute already has that. And so looking to hurt them uh, in the wallet uh, and take advantage of that for asset forfeiture and then also looking for tax evasion uh, if you get federal uh, partners involved. It's important to involve victim services from the start. Um, Law enforcement agencies oftentimes don't make uh, this a priority. So that initial interaction with victims to build the rapport is very crucial. Uh, understanding the effects uh, of the emotional and physical trauma that these victims have gone through uh, is very important. Um, trauma bonding definitely plays a role in uh, these situations and uh, the pimps and the people exploiting these girls are in their heads. I like to say that uh, modern-day slavery is not the bond or binding of the hands, but it's the bond that's on the mind of these victims because they're definitely in their heads. And these girls often don't self-identify as victims, um, and they believe that if this is the only person that cares about me, if something happens to him, i.e. he gets arrested, what's going to happen to me? Uh, and, and that, that challenge that you have to overcome. Showing compassion uh, and patience and empathy uh, is a must. Uh, conveying sensitivity to their needs and knowing resources is vital, and then being able to provide what you say. Uh, you don't want to tell them you're going to do something for them and not be able to do it. So that might be getting a hotel room for them, giving them a place to decompress or just a place uh, where they can take a minute to get some rest, um, it's going to be a process of and times when you're dealing with these victims that are not from your community, uh, they're from other communities, they're non-residents and they're traveling through. So involving federal agencies uh, like the FBI or Ham Homeland Security, which are going to have resources in other cities and other states is beneficial. Uh, interviews are vital. Uh, multiple interviews are oftentimes necessary with these victims. Um, to get through the whole situation. And, and that's challenging for law enforcement because oftentimes uh, 
police officers and detectives expect that uh, we're going to get the who, what, when, where, how, why in one sit down. And uh, if things aren't chronological and concise, uh, then we find or we have a tendency to doubt the victim where if we understand how trauma affects the brain and the trauma bonding that's involved with these victims, we know that uh, being patient and uh, uh, multiple interviews are oftentimes required because it's just not going to be linear and they're not going to be able to remember things like we would hope that they, they would. So using the same interviewers is important for victim familiarity. It increases the willingness for them to talk and it also reduces conflicting information. Uh, it's very important not to be judgmental. Uh, and I find that, uh, you know, sometimes just uh, getting that initial contact with them to let them know that it, it appears that uh, they're in a situation they don't want to be in and uh, that you're there to help them. So one last thing I want to point out, it's important. We mostly see home as a positive place. We like to go home at the end of our day where our families and our loved ones are, and it's, it's a good, safe place for us. But a lot of these victims are running from homes that are not a safe place for them. And so keep in mind when you're, when you're talking and trying to help these victims, oftentimes if they hear us say, we're going to get you back home, uh, if that's not a positive thing for them, uh, that may cause them to run and to be distrustful of us, even though it was good intention on our part. So it's important to remember that uh, it only takes one, only takes one police officer, one detective, one motel employee or a social worker or a teacher or a citizen for that matter to recognize when a person is in a situation of sex trafficking uh, and they get involved and it gets a person out of a terrible situation. So remember that uh, it only takes one. Thank you, Sean. So I guess I'll pick up now. This is uh, Frank Masana from Suffolk County. Um, I think the uh, slides want to cooperate here. So my involvement in human trafficking began in 2017. I was put in charge of the kidnap team, which also oversees all the human trafficking investigations in the county. It was a fairly easy task at the time, as there were none of these investigations. The kidnap team basically consisted of myself and a detective sergeant. After we were given these titles, we sat down and decided to look at human trafficking. In the past, many bosses saw prostitution as a problem in New York City only and felt that if we did prostitution investigations, all we were doing was bringing crime from the city out to Suffolk County. We had a feeling that that was not really true. We wanted to see if it was something that was a problem here in Suffolk County. We spent a couple of months thinking about it and planning and brought the idea to our, our administration. In October of 2017, I was given a couple of police officers and two detectives so we could look into it. We called it the Human Trafficking Initiative, or HTI for short. Within a very short time, we realized that the problem was a lot more serious than even we had initially thought. We were able to show that there's so much work to be done that we could barely keep up. We were able to create a permanent command called the Human Trafficking Investigations Unit in March of 2018. And as most probably know, new things don't come easy in the police department. So I saw this as a tremendous feat. I'll talk a little bit about the unit later, but to put the work into perspective, in the 12 months prior to HTI, there were zero sex trafficking arrests. Taking it back even further, since sex trafficking was a law on the books in New York State, there were only six or six, seven successful prosecutions in the whole state, only two in Suffolk County history. Since the beginning of HTI and through the efforts of the investigators in the new unit, we have arrested 55 people for sex trafficking related charges. 313 total charges on those people, and 134 of those charges are specifically sex trafficking. And we, as we go in more into this, the most important part of the statistics is that we have identified and interviewed and offer services to over 220 victims at this point. I'd like to give you one of our success stories as a quick case study. Most of these cases take a long time to come full circle. This past December, we had our first trial finally completed. It was a 12-month-long case of a blood gang member. It's fairly typical of what we have seen. We have a lot of gang members involved in trafficking. Not necessarily that it's an organized gang activity, but just that the individual gang members see this as an easy way to make money. It seems that they got tired of the hazards of drug dealing, worrying if they're selling to an undercover or just the risk in selling to strangers. Plus, and I know it's been said before, but that one piece of crack they sell is only sold one time. But even if they have one girl, 
She can be sold many times a day for minimal overhead. Most of the girls that we've talked to see five clients a day, but that's the bare minimum. We spoke to one who was seeing 28 guys a day. Yeah, 28. I can't even imagine that. This guy we arrested had a long rap sheet, arrested on drug sales, drug possession, and everything else. Nothing ever seemed to get him to stop, but we identified several girls that he was exploiting and started a sex trafficking case. He took it to trial and it lasted for several weeks. The great part is, at the end of December, he was found guilty on all counts by the jury. As you can see, there are several sex trafficking counts and each one of them a felony. On the B violent, he got 25 years flat with 20 years of parole, and after that he has to register as a sex offender. So even with good behavior, he will be doing somewhere in the area of 21 to 23 years in prison and then be watched for almost the rest of his life. It was a huge win for us. So much so that another trial we had coming up recently decided to plead guilty once hearing of this conviction. But this is a great case that shows for years Hi, we tried to get this guy off the street. Hi, Lieutenant. Yes. Hello. Apologies. This is William. Uh, sorry. Um, could you speak a little bit louder into the microphone and adjust um, – the mic a little closer to you. We had just a little interruption with the audio. Do apologize for interrupting. Okay, that Probably sounds a little, a little bit better. better. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Apologies for the interruption. No problem. Um, so anyway, this is a great case that shows that for years people tried to get this guy off the street, but it ended up being a sex trafficking conviction that actually did it. Understanding human trafficking is obviously an important part of tackling the problem and I wanted to go through a basic overview of trafficking. One of the biggest problems with human trafficking that I've found is that it's very misunderstood. It's misunderstood by the public mostly, but even by law enforcement. We have done presentations many, many times throughout the last couple of years, and it amazes me that even to this day, when we have a law enforcement audience, people with 30 plus years on, and afterwards the most common question I get is, does this really happen here? I think people have an image in their head when they hear human trafficking of people being smuggled across the border in a box truck or the movie Taken. And while that's part of it, and it does happen, it's very different than what we see on the local level here. What we've seen here are classic grooming situations. It's a very indirect action. When we have that unlawful control, it's less of a deadbolt on the door and more that the girl has a feeling that she just can't leave or leave the situation. And of course, when we talk about a girl who's underage, we don't even need force, fraud, or coercion. The juvenile involved in prostitution and trafficking is automatically a victim. And I tend to say he for the bad guy and she for the victim. It could happen to anyone, but what we've seen is that it's an extremely high percentage as a crime against women. The control of the girl is so subtle that a lot of times she doesn't even realize she's a victim. We've had girls who we're taking a statement from and will ask if the guy was ever violent. She'll say no, but then a few minutes later, she's talking about the guy grabbing her by the throat and pushing her up against the wall. We have to stop her and say, wait a minute, you just said he wasn't violent. And she explains, oh, oh, that's not violent. He really beat that other girl. That was just normal. And we have to explain to her that it's not normal. Things like that have just become a way of life for her. The bad guys in these cases are master manipulators. They're very patient, and they promise the girls whatever line of nonsense they're going to use to hook them in, whether that's promises of money or being in a music video, but most likely it's affection. And these guys are also experts at identifying their target. Unfortunately, the girls we see have really tough backgrounds. One of the reoccurring things that we see with these girls, and although it's very sad, is that the vast, vast majority of them have some type of childhood sexual abuse. Many of them have multiple rapes starting at 9, 10 years old and continuing for years. A lot of them were in foster care. Some of them were inappropriately touched by their biological father, were moved out of their household, and then foster dad touched them as well. Girls have very low self-esteem, and this is usually compounded by mental illness, drug use, and the combination of all of this. When the girls have either inappropriate male attention or no male attention, they have this affection starvation. And what happens is that when some guy comes along and shows them a little attention or tells them that he's going to be their boyfriend, they jump at the chance. I would like to think that most people listening to this wouldn't fall for the things that they do, but when you look at their backgrounds and really understand where they come from, you start to understand why they do what they do. This is a quote from a New York Times article, which is a little dated now, back in 2012. The last time I looked at it, it was still on the internet, and the sad part is that not enough has changed since the article was written. But it says, a young man approached her and told her she was attractive. He thought that he was a rapper and she was flattered. He told her that he wanted her to be his girlfriend, she recalls wistfully. If you look at this quote, it sounds lighthearted, maybe the beginning of a relationship. 
But for this girl, it was the start of years of forced drug use, torture, and forced prostitution. And like I said earlier, these guys are patient. In the beginning, it really does start out as a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship. And like in a lot of relationships, there's gifts. We've seen stories where the bad guy gives the girl a phone. Phone's a nice present nowadays, a lot of money. But in reality, what he's doing, he gives her that phone with his contact information in it. And he takes away her phone with every friend, with every family member, with every source of stability in her life. And he interjects himself as the only source of stability. So if there's something good, she has to call him. If there's something bad, she has to call him. And this relationship really could be romantic in the beginning. But soon the guy will tell her that they need money for the life he promised her. Now I admit that I have no idea how you get someone to sell themselves for your profit, but they do. And even after the prostitution starts, the girl may still be doing okay at first, maybe keeping the money she earns. Soon enough though, the guy starts saying, you know, I paid for the hotel room, so I really need my cut. Fast forward a few months and now it's, I paid for the hotel room and the drugs and it's not really fair, I need my cut. And you can see where this is going. Soon, he's keeping all the money and keeping her so high she has no idea what's going on. This fake debt that she's racking up, she could never repay. One of the early victims we dealt with, we asked if she remembered how she got started with the bad guy. She explained that she was on a bus going to a mall. As she was riding, she noticed the guy sitting across from her staring at her. She said she immediately knew he was a bad guy. And when her stop came, she got off and he followed her, then grabbed her arm. As she turned around, he apologized. He apologized for staring at her. He said he just found her so pretty and couldn't stop staring. He gave her his Facebook information and told her to hit him up. We said, you didn't, did you? She said, no, well, not for two weeks. We said, you knew he was bad, why would you do that? She said, look, he called me pretty. I know I'm no prize, but no one has ever called me pretty. Now that interaction was the beginning of four years of forced drug use, prostitution, and violence for her. Now what I always wonder is, how many girls does he say that to a day? He could tell 20 girls that line, and even if one or two calls him back, he's making a lot of money. I wish I could say this manipulation or grooming process was very difficult to figure out, or only a few people could really do it. Unfortunately, this guy literally Hi. wrote a book on it. Lieutenant? Yes. Apologies uh, to interrupt you again. Um, would you, uh, so individuals are saying that the, uh, it's coming in low again. Would you uh, be able to switch back over to um, what you had before and just maybe speak? Um, yeah, speak phone and then maybe speak one or two levels higher than normal. And again, I do apologize for the interruption. Okay, no problem. I'll, uh, I'll switch back over. Can you hear me on that? Yes, and maybe one or two levels higher than your normal speaking voice um, for individuals okay. on line. Thank you. You got Thank it. You. I'll try it again. So anyway, this guy literally wrote a book on it. Uh, this book, Pimpology, The 48 Laws of the Game, I've heard it's the most requested book in prison. The guy actually details exactly the grooming process I just talked about. You don't even have to be very imaginative. He doesn't even wait much. On the first page, about six lines in, he says, that's all pimping is, is control, mastering another. Throughout the book, he talks about psychological manipulation and controlling the mind, controlling the body. What scares me about this book is that it makes it too easy, and unfortunately, this is still for sale. As we changed our mindset as a department looking into human trafficking, we realized we also had to change how we looked at the people involved in it. One problem is identifying it and realizing that it's not a typical investigation. Trafficking is not so easy to pick out if you don't look at the whole picture. Even the difference between sexual assault, which a lot of the girls are victims of, and sex trafficking is not so clear. If I showed you the movie of a rape, you'd be able to immediately pick out who the bad guy was, who the victim was, you'd know that she didn't want what happened to her and that the bad guy was not acting in her best interest. And the most important part is that you'd automatically feel bad for her. You'd have empathy and sympathy. With our sex trafficking victim, though, the lines get very blurred. You have a third party involved. You have a girl providing the services and the customer receiving the services, but you have that third party controlling everything and receiving the money, so that muddies the water. The victim may appear to consent to the sexual activity, she may be opening the motel room door or even posting herself online. And that injury we talked about is not so obvious. It's not necessarily a black eye or a broken jaw, although it could be. There's a better chance that it's just an ongoing feeling of just not being able to leave. And like we talked about before, the victim looks at her bad guy or the bad guy as her boyfriend, as someone who has her best interests in mind. And whether it's public perception or how they portray themselves, the empathy and sympathy is not necessarily a given. They come from rough backgrounds, very tough patients. 
Even the difference between prostitution and sex trafficking is sometimes difficult to understand. There is such a thing as a freelance prostitute. They're doing it for whatever reason they feel they need to or want to do it. They know they're breaking prostitution laws and the customers are breaking the patronizing prostitution laws. But that's it, there's no one else involved. They're keeping the money that they make and there's not much more to it. Our trafficking victim though, if you just look very quickly at it, looks exactly like prostitution. The difference is when you look at the bigger picture, they're a coerced sex worker. Even though they appear to be complicit in the sexual acts, they're not. The sexual activity is actually forced. And who are we looking to prosecute? Not the trafficking victim. We're looking to prosecute the pimp, the trafficker or the bad guy. And this change in how we looked at the victim changed how we speak to them. When we go into an interview, we're going to use a much softer approach. We're going to approach them more like we would that victim of sexual assault. If we talk about that rape victim, we would have that sympathy. We would want to make sure they're comfortable. That victim, whether or not they have a criminal back background, it isn't relevant, so we don't bring that up. They usually present themselves in a way that you feel bad for them and probably want to see the bad guy get caught, so they're going to want to help us. If we have to call them several months later for court, they're probably going to answer our call and help out. Our sex trafficking victim, though, not so much. They often have a criminal background, but since we're looking at them as victims, we have to remember that it doesn't matter. They probably don't portray themselves in a way to get sympathy just because of their lifestyle. And even though they're crime victims, they don't go out of their way to help us, especially not in the beginning. Most of the girls we deal with in the beginning are telling us where to go and how to get there. Because if they're in this lifestyle, this prostitution world, they know that getting arrested is more of a when and not an if. They know that getting arrested is part of the job. There's a good chance they've been coached by the bad guy as to what to say or not to say when in contact with law enforcement. The bottom line is that because of the lifestyle that they live in and their background, they're a very tough patient. We have to remember that we need to take their background into account when we talk to them. One of the things my guys had to learn is to understand how their mind works. It was an interview done regarding victims talking about their backgrounds. It says talking about it is emotionally very difficult and how that can behaviorally manifest is that the story can come out in bits and pieces and fits and starts and cycles back over on itself or, oh wait a minute, I remember this detail. It comes out in a very disorganized way. And for law enforcement, they take those stops and starts and cycles back as suspicious. We know as cops we want to fill out the form, name, date of birth, and exactly what happened. And very early on, we figured out that we couldn't ask these victims questions the same way we would ask anyone else. I heard a great example of this. I call it the sticky note theory, that if you wrote your whole day down on post-it notes, everything you did during the day and put them on a wall in chronological order, breakfast would be somewhere on the left, lunch in the middle, and dinner on the right. So that if I asked you who did you see after lunch, you'd go about halfway on the wall, you'd look a little to the right, you'd pull the post-it note off and read it. It would be no big deal. But for these girls, take that exact example to write down every detail of their life. Then open all the windows and doors and let the wind blow all the notes around the room. So when you ask them what happened a year ago, they're picking up sticky notes trying to find the answer and they'll tell you, well, I cheated on my math test in third grade. But be before we realized this, we would get aggravated and see that as them lying. But in reality, we were asking to do something that they physically could not do. They will eventually get around to the question that you asked, but it has to be on their own time. We just have to learn to be patient and let their mind work around to the information that we wanted. The interviews take a long time sometimes upwards of five hours. It's all about patience and building rapport. Even if they wanted to tell you everything right away, showing this embarrassing side to someone takes courage and feeling comfortable. Other things that we learned that helped in interviewing these girls seem so simple, but I wouldn't have even have thought of them. Most of these things come down to giving respect and treating another human being with compassion. The first thing we usually do is ask her what she would like to be called. A lot of these girls have never made a decision for themselves in their lives. They've never been asked their opinion, so when you ask them what they'd like to be called by, it throws them off. We also stopped using the term prostitute. None of these girls dreamed of being prostitutes when they were younger. Even the first time I said prostitute today, most people had an image in their head and it's usually not a nice one. Simply leaving that out of the conversation can help in building trust. While we were figuring out all these changes to how we interview, we did something else that really made a big difference. I had mentioned earlier, but in March of 2018, we actually created a new command called the Human Trafficking Investigations Unit. We are the first dedicated unit for human trafficking in New York State that I know of. The unit consists of two police officers, five detectives, a detective sergeant, and myself to oversee the operation. They only work on investigations involving prostitution and human trafficking. We do prostitution investigations, but not random ones. 
By the time we attempt a prostitution arrest, we have a good idea that the girl is a victim and not a freelance prostitute. And because there's so much out there, we try to prioritize those girls that have a particularly violent or aggressive pimp. Now, it's no secret that dealing with our victims is not an easy task. And early on, we figured out another part to this, that we couldn't do it alone. As cops, we can investigate a robbery or a burglary and really don't need other agencies. With trafficking, though, we needed the social services or advocacy angle or we can't do it. There's a point at which law enforcement runs out of options. We partnered with an advocacy group, the Empowerment Collaborative of Long Island, and they are able to be the support in the girls' lives that they so desperately need. They help us keep the girls on the right track. Together, we started a task force, the Suffolk County Anti-Trafficking Initiative. Through this task force, we partnered with the FBI, HSI, the Sheriff's Department, which runs our jails, probation, the District Attorney's Office, which created their own HCI team, other social services agencies, schools, really anyone who would like to help. The task force has been amazing. Everyone who has a seat at the table has something to offer. Now, I'm not a social worker and I don't pretend to be one, but when we need something in that area, I have someone to call. We had a great example of this process working a few months ago. One of our girls was being held in jail and two males showed up to bail her out. Through the sharing of information, the corrections officers at the jail knew the two guys were the girls' traffickers. They called ECLI and my unit and together and within the hour, we had a plan in place. We bailed the girl out, but had the advocates meet her at a different entrance to the jail. She was met with a supportive group that had a place for her to go, and it wasn't with the trafficker. More and more, we are seeing great results like this. Now, I would love to say that every one of the girls we are seeing are, are doing great. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. In 2019 alone, we lost 10 girls to fatal overdoses. It's a rocky path for them, but we have had many successes, and that's what we concentrate on. I could go on about the benefits that we've seen through the task force forever, but I know I'm uh, nearing the end of my time. If nothing else, I just wanted to pass along the way we view our victims and the cooperative effort that we use to combat human trafficking. In my opinion, both these pieces are vital to the su success that we've seen. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Sean, you want to take it? Yeah, also, Frank, thank you. We've got a, uh, I just wanted to note here, we've got a lot of really good discussion going on in the chat box. So if our participants have not been watching that, it's definitely worth, uh, worth looking at. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes going through some resources that are available, and then uh, all, all the presenters will be available for some question and answers uh, for the remainder of our, of our time here. Again, if you've got questions, uh, type them in the uh, audience question box, and we'll uh, try to address those. So the first resource that I want to point out is actually the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention um, webpage that is uh, dedicated to human trafficking resources. Um, the link is provided here on the slide. Um, on this page, you'll find links about information um, such as the Department's Justice's anti-trafficking efforts, a searchable database for victim services, uh, guidance for judicial officials, um, there's links to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and there are also technical assistance resources. Anybody that's involved in this issue of even more broadly human trafficking, um, this is a great resource for um, information um, in that regard. So the next um, slide that I want to show you um, may actually be tuned in a little bit more towards law, the law enforcement participants on the, on the line, but it is helpful for everybody. It's the Homeland Security's Blue Campaign, and it's a national public awareness campaign designed to educate the public, law enforcement, and other industry partners to recognize the indicators of human trafficking and then how to appropriately respond um, to possible cases. So on this site, you'll find some online training courses and video that are specific for law enforcement. You'll find awareness training and video for the public, um, links to uh, actually provide crime tips about this kind of activity, and a full library with white papers, information sheets, toolkits, and guides. They also offer an array of uh, pamphlets and the cards, like the one you see on the right, right side that it was is intended for officers to carry with them so they can actually identify indicators of trafficking. So again, this site is full of helpful tools um, for us. The uh, next resource I mentioned early in the presentation, which is the Polaris Project. 
um, but they have a lot more than just maps and uh, maps and uh, graphics on their on their on their website. Um, they actually operate the National Human Traffic um, Hotline. They um, so you find information there about that. Um, you'll also find uh, research statistics and data. It's extremely valuable in guiding policy. Um, you'll find guidebooks, um, including a guidebook that includes the 25 human trafficking uh, business models that I uh, interested early. So anybody that's interested in, in taking an effort to try to find human trafficking in their community, I think that this is a great resource on where to look um, for this type of activity. Um, there's public awareness information and uh, victim services like the uh, human trafficking hotline. And that stands out. I wanted to uh, sort of talk about the human trafficking hotline for just a, a moment here. So again, this is operated by the Polis Project. Um, victims can contact the hotline either through a toll-free number, text, or live chat. And there are a lot of resources on this site about safety planning, signs, indicators, and even tips for communicating with victims of trafficking. So that could be very helpful for anybody that is dealing with victims of trafficking and uh, law enforcement officers that may, may, may do the same type of, type of work. So just a little bit more broadly, here, here are these resources that are uh, that are on here, and a few more, a few more resources that may be valuable uh, to folks that are working with with human human trafficking. And the present, I just want to remind everybody that the presentation is being recorded, so you don't have to necessarily write this down. You'll be able, you'll have access to this information um, into the future, also. So, some again, some more resources, articles, and so forth about uh, the the topic of human trafficking and gangs. Then I wanted to talk about the National Gang Center. And without going into a lot of detail, detail and giving you a commercial, I did, wanna, I did want to um, point out that we, we do have a website that is a centralized repository with an incredible amount of information about gangs, tools for anyone dealing with this problem in their community. I encourage everyone to spend some time looking for the resource available, resources available on the site. And here you're going to find, uh, like to the upper right hand, you'll see library. It's got it's full of publications, webinars, and videos. There's a great video on there on why kids join gangs. I would encourage everybody to watch that. Uh, there's a searchable database of prevention, intervention, and suppression strategies. Um, that is an awesome resource for communities that are uh, planning gang, gang intervention and prevention activities. There's access to technical assistance for communities working to reduce gang activity, including those implementing the OJJDP comprehensive gang model. There's a compilation of gang-related news from across the country, and this is updated continuously, almost on a daily basis. Um, so if you want to stay current with what is going on in the world of gangs, you can do that here. There's also a listing of gang registration that's organized by state, um, so you can go directly to uh, your state's legislation and compare it to other, compare your laws to other, other laws across the nation. We have a, our gang info exchange, which is a resource for criminal justice and law enforcement professionals, and it's a uh, tool that these professionals can use to share information about uh, gangs. And there's so much more. I'd encourage everybody to take a look at the gang site and um, and look at that. If you'll bear with me for just a second here, I'm going to go back and look at the slides because it looks like somehow we have missed a slide. Okay, so here's the contact, contact information for the National Gang Center. And this is how you can get a hold of us if you've got specific questions. Um, that you want to ask or need assistance, we'll be happy to do everything that we can can to help you. So I'm going to move into the uh, question and answer, and there have actually been quite a few, quite a few um, interesting discussions and questions in the uh, in the chat box, and we pulled some of those out, and we're going to try to work on those. I don't know that we're going to have enough time to get to every single question that has been been asked, 
um, but certainly we'll try to uh, address most of them and the ones that may not have been answered as part of the part of the presentation. I want there was a lot of before we go into the questions there was a lot of discussion about um, the use of the term prostitution as opposed to trafficking victim and a lot of uh, information specifically about uh, refor referring referring to um, girls as prostitutes. Uh, so somebody asked specifically, is there a difference between a prostitute and a victim of human, human trafficking? And there absolutely is. Um, so there is actually an organization that is called Rights for Girls, and that's the uh, slide that I was looking for earlier. And so the uh, website is rights for the numeral for girls.org, and their campaign is just this. There is no such thing as a child prostitute. And that reinforces what the federal law says. We talked about how you don't have to um, prove that there is coercion if the victim is under the age 18 because children cannot make those decisions. There's no way a child can voluntarily um, agree to commit an act of prostitution. It's just, it just can't happen. So again, their campaign, there is no such thing as a child prostitute, is a great resource. Um, and I would encourage everybody to look at that and just everybody, all of the participants. Um, you know, this is, I think, a Lieutenant uh, the Senate issue that this is one of the biggest factors in this is changing perceptions. And that's throughout law enforcement and it's throughout the community. It's everywhere. And it's really important that we, uh, we pay attention to that ad advocacy and we are using um, the terms appropriately. So there's definitely a difference between a prostitute um, or more appropriately these days a sex worker who is making a voluntary decision to participate in this activity. I think that we find that more and more most of these cases are actually human trafficking. Um, and it's a case where a, uh, a uh, so-called prostitute has been forced in uh, to this, this line of work and not doing it voluntarily. So with that I want to address one more issue that was a hot topic in the um, in the in the discussion, and then we'll uh, get our other pre presenters involved in some of the other questions. Um, so there was a lot of discussion in the pre-questions and in the in the uh, in the question and answer about how boys are men. And I know our presenters use the term girls a lot because the, the reality is that is what they are dealing with, especially when we're talking about gang involved human trafficking. Um, I can tell you in terms of uh, the statistics and research on males involved in gang specific um, human trafficking is needs a lot of work um, just to be honest with you um, what we know that uh, globally if you consider human traffic in terms of sex trafficking and labor traffic trafficking globally about half the victims are male um, you see a smaller percentage globally uh, when you talk specifically about sex trafficking, um, but still, I have seen numbers as high as maybe 400,000 male victims of sex trafficking um, globally. Um, when it comes to the gangs, um, like I said in the study earlier, even that study showed that there was a couple of percent. There was a few percent, about two percent, and I've seen that number in other places. About two percent were males that were, that were involved. We all know the number is much higher. But when it comes to gangs specifically, um, if you understand the, the nature of the culture of gangs, is that they have very little uh, respect or value um, for women in most cases. And uh, I think that's why you see more female victims um, involved with gang trafficking. And I know that doesn't address the issue fully, but I do want to make sure that everybody understands that this is absolutely not limited uh, to females and likely not limited to females, even with gang-involved sex trafficking. I just want to be clear on that and make sure that everybody understands that there's a huge problem with boys and, uh, and, and men also. So I think what I'm going to do is we had a lot of uh, questions about the um, different communities, the size of the community, the location of the community, whether it's urban or rural or so forth. So Guy, can I get you to weigh on that? Is this uh, is it a myth that gangs and human trafficking just do not exist in rural communities, or is the impact limited to any particular type of community? I think that's a very common misperception that uh, sex trafficking 
only occurs in bigger cities or in other countries when in fact, like I said earlier, if uh, your community has a demand for commercial sex, and I would think, you know, uninfluenced by a large nearby metro area, cities on interstate freeways that uh, are 20 to 25,000 and larger are going to have a demand for commercial sex and, uh, you know, people that exploit trafficking victims are going to take them where the money is. So I think in smaller cities, you're going to find that the majority uh, are non-resident uh, victims who are being brought through on the interstate freeway system on circuits, but most definitely it can be uh, local girls who are exploited locally, and it can also be, you know, local girls who are transported somewhere else. I saw someone in uh, one of the comments uh, may have confused boyfriend for John, and I just wanted to clarify that when I said boyfriend, uh, I meant uh, the person who is exploiting the female. It's very common that she believes he is her boyfriend. And even in situations where what we would consider a traditional boyfriend-girlfriend relationship, um, you know, if the boyfriend is persuading, manipulating, uh, guilt-tripping the girl to engage in commercial sex for his benefit, that can be the same under federal statute of compelling another through force, fraud, or coercion. So uh, I think when we learn uh, and become more familiar and stop seeing and putting in boxes girls that we consider prostitutes and start to see them as victims, uh, we would need to really overcome that. This, this situation, I think, is what was similar in the 90s to domestic violence when it took a generation for law enforcement, the community, and the justice system to realize and then enforce laws that, uh, you know, domestic violence was not okay. And I think we're in the infant stages of sex trafficking, and hopefully uh, we continue to improve that and uh, change people's perception. Awesome. Thank you for that uh, input and clarification, uh, Detective Baker. So we've also got some questions about agencies working together, and in particular about uh, law, local law enforcement agencies working with federal agencies to, to combat the problem. Um, Lieutenant Masana, could you weigh in on that? How effective are these partnerships? Is that occurring um, in law enforcement? And are, and are these partnerships effective is the question. Yeah, I think it's one of the, uh, the main parts of trafficking that's kind of interesting to me is that the partnerships are unlike anything I've ever seen before. Uh, we work with more different agencies and, and different types of agencies too. I mean, again, you know, obviously I represent the law enforcement part, but without the advocacy group, without that, uh, you know, the social services side, it just doesn't work. And more and more we're working with uh, the federal, you know, the, the federal laws which sometimes have different sentencing, different victim services, different, uh, you know, uh, statutes and, and where it fits in. Um, we've had some of our cases go federally with some very severe sentences, and then some things are more suited on the state level. So, uh, I mean, yeah, it's something more than I've, there's been nothing like this before that I've seen. I appreciate that input and that, that perspective. Uh, the research actually shows that um, these partnerships and collaborations are extremely effective. So, Lieutenant Masena, I'm also um, I wanted to wanted to ask you another question, a related question. Um, you have done a lot of work to build partnerships with um, agencies that serve victims. Can you comment a little bit about what you think that um, how they help you specifically? As opposed to, for, for instance, I know that you've, you've partnered with some uh, with some organizations that provide some social service uh, providers that provide victim services. How are they a better fit, and what role do they play in your actual law enforcement investigations? Um, they, they have such an important role because part of this too is that um, I'm trying to think how to say it the best way, but you know the girls that we deal with sometimes they're not ready. Sometimes they're not ready to deal with law enforcement. Sometimes they're not ready to talk about it. Um, and it takes a little bit of uh, convincing is the wrong word, but explaining to them about what, you know, uh, life should be like and what the possibilities that they have are. And sometimes the advocates do a better job at that. 
I think they provide the stability, uh, are able to show the girls, you know, kind of like what the future could hold for them if they, if they were able to change things a little bit. Uh, you know, I can't force someone to cooperate with us, nor would I want to. Uh, and the advocates sometimes are able to be that, um, that friend or actually the advocacy group we work with had one of the best lines I've ever heard. They said that they provide for the girls what a good friend would do. Um, some of the girls that we see, and it's, I guess, surprising to me, they couldn't even get a ride to court if they needed it. They don't have anyone to call. They're just kind of really on their own. And our advocacy group provides that friend for them, you know, whether it's sometimes Christmas gifts at, at Christmas time or, you know, a ride to court or just some advice, whatever it is. Sometimes it's even just a phone call just to, you know, when they're anxious about something. Things that in, in my, you know, if I'm staying in my lane, that's not what I'm going to be able to provide for them, but they are. And that kind of sets the girl up in such a way that she is receptive to the law enforcement role. She's able to understand where we're coming from and understanding that we're not trying to trick her into something. We're just trying to get at the truth and be able to put, you know, someone who did harm to her, you know, have them accountable. So the, the advocates, um, there's no one way that they work. They work in every uh, kind of phase of the investigation. And the biggest thing with working together is, from my point of view and theirs, we each have to stay in our own lane. We each have to do our job. But when we work together, we get kind of that both sides of the coin, and it really helps the girl out. Um, and again, you know, there's probably many different ways to do this, but uh, the organization and the, uh, the relationships we've built have worked out very well for us. Well, thank you for that input. That's extremely important. So. I want to address the, there were some questions about schools and uh, how this impacts schools and are there training, training programs and so forth available for, for awareness. Um, and it, this absolutely addresses uh, schools um, actually in the discussion. There was, uh, the, the research shows us that it's impacting mainly middle and high schools and that again that has to do with the age of, of entry um, for the victims. Um, but there was actually some discussion in the chat box about uh, this occurring in elementary schools. Um, so know this, um, if you have human trafficking in your community, and particularly gang-related um, human trafficking in, in your community, the schools are being used for recruiting grounds, and the research tells us that, that's, and the cases tell us that. That's, that's very clear. And are there pro training programs available? There absolutely are. If you'd refer back to those resources that I gave you, there, within those resources, there are awareness programs that are designed specifically um, for educators and students. Um, so there are resources available. And another question we had uh, was about social media. And I wanted to, we've got just a couple minutes later, so I wanted to make sure that I covered this. Um, how does social media contribute both uh, positively and neg negatively to this issue? Um, I'll start with the positive side of this, is that uh, social media brings awareness, and that is awesome. Um, that we are starting to change the perceptions of the, uh, the people where those perceptions need to be made. Um, the negative side of this is that gangs are uh, highly active in social media. Um, and it's an absolute fact that gangs use social media for recruiting and to carry out crimes. Um, and that includes human trafficking. Uh, so don't think that these gangs aren't just as sophisticated um, as anybody else, they will use whatever means are necessary in order to um, in order to recruit uh, these victims into human trafficking. And social media plays a plays a huge role in that. In fact, it's 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 such a significant role that the um, National Gang Center Center is actually working now with OJJDP and Intact to do a webinar on that specific issue. So look for that probably towards the end of June and join us for that discussion. So with that said, I have uh, less than a minute, and I've got to apologize um, that we weren't able to get to all of the questions, not even close to all the questions in the chat box. I want you to know that all of us as presenters, we're available after this, after this, after this. If you'll uh, just contact the, uh, the gang center, if you need some more information on a particular topic, we'll, we'll make sure that we point you in, in, the right, in the right direction. And with that, I'm going to turn the presentation back over to Will, I think, is going to take the wheel for us. I want to thank our presenters and all the participants. 
and particularly the participants that have been so active in the chat box. Um, it's very informative for us. We thank you. All right, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Sean. Thank you, uh, Detective Baker. Thank you to uh, Lieutenant Misana for uh, bringing this very uh, important information to our audience. And thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you to the participants for a very active discussion. Again, apologies you weren't able to get to all the questions. However, please note, as Sean said, the content information is um, available where uh, all of our presenters can be reached if you do have additional questions. But before we wrap up, I do have just a few uh, things to cover uh, before we end. Just to let everyone know that if you're looking to get in contact with NTAC uh, or would like to sign up for our listserv where you can get access to additional webinars like this in the future, please uh, feel free to contact us at this site or you can click on the click here there in order to sign up for the NTAC listserv where you can receive notification about future webinars. Uh, you can also go to Facebook and uh, search us on OJJDP TTA to learn more about upcoming trainings and additional resources. Um, also, if you're looking to get in contact with OJJDP, uh, you may do so by uh, going to the help desk. Uh, you can dial the number here or you can send an email to the usdoj.gov email address here in order to get contact with the uh, OJJDP TTA help desk. You can also sign up for the OJJDP uh, Juve Just Listserv to learn more about webinars as well by clicking the sign up link there. Do you have a training and technical assistance need for your organization? Well, if so, please reach out uh, or uh, submit a request for help via the TTA 360 platform. You can access the platform through the URL link located on this slide. Again, I've uh, mentioned this before in the chat, uh, and I mentioned it at the beginning of the webinar on the top end, but I'll mention it here as well. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube page if you'd like to review it at a later time. Uh, for those who experience any technical uh, issues during the webinar with audio, please note that when we will have this webinar posted where you can review any parts where you may have experienced any audio issues. Again, the uh, page uh, link is active here where you can click on it and it's also in the slides as well. And if you like to get any supporting materials, you can just reach out to the OJJDP TTA help desk. Please note this disclaimer. Take a few seconds just to read this here. And finally, just wanted to uh, inform you all about an upcoming event that we have uh, coming up soon. We have an, another webinar this uh, Friday. Uh, with our partners at uh, SHIFT and the Innocent Justice Foundation. We also have another webinar coming up in May uh, with our colleagues at CFF. Uh, the Learn More links are live here where you can click on it to learn more about these webinars. Also, the Register Now link is indeed live and active where you can click on it in order to register for each of these webinars. Again, these, uh, are, these uh, links are live in the um, PowerPoint, and you can access the PowerPoint in the handouts. Uh, but again, before we close, I do have one last uh, poll question to you all. So how do you plan on applying the information from this webinar in your work? There's This is multiple select, so you can please check all that apply. Uh, just take a few moments to provide us this feedback so we can get a good idea of uh, how our audience uh, plans to apply this uh, in the future. Uh, again, you can just select any of these options that apply, and you can select multiple options here. I'll leave this uh, poll up just a few more seconds just for folks to go ahead and um, uh, complete the poll. But again, I wanted to thank our presenters.